cool. We're live. Welcome to the show, George. Nice. Thanks very much for having us. Um, so triathlon training at the moment. What's the what's the plans there? You're doing a triathlon in a few weeks, is it? Yeah. So I've uh, I skipped the entry point of triathlon and I've gone straight to the the big daddy Ironman. Um, so it will be my first triathlon. It's on August twentieth in Copenhagen. Um, basically, I turned forty in June, had a bit of a midlife crisis, and immediately signed up for it. Thought I'd try something that's a little bit out of my comfort zone. So, to be fair, training has been going pretty well on the whole. Um, so I've really sort of discovered that I like cycling, um, and I'm better at swimming than I thought. Uh, the running, yeah, the running is like running for that distance and stuff. Under fatigue, I kind of hoping the high rocks training will sort of do me well. But um, yeah, it's a different kind of fatigue, so it's obviously a lot of fueling, really. But um, enjoy it so far. running distance in a tr- in an Ironman, sorry, as a, yes, a mar- marathon. marathon, yeah, yeah. full marathon. Okay. Yeah, so it's a t- it's a two point four mile swim, open water and the sea, and then one hundred and twelve miles on a bike to the Danish countryside, um, and then yeah, and then a marathon. So. Um, I've got no idea what the weather's going to be in Copenhagen end of August. It, you know, I don't know if they're in a heat wave or I don't know if it's like here, miserable. Yeah. But um, yeah, no training. I've basically done an eight week block. So it's like a crash course in all things triathlon. So yeah. Nice. How, how have you found the training? Has it been like, it was just primarily zone two in it? You just, just putting in the hours or what? No, so I've tried to hack it a little bit because I didn't really want to, you know, a lot of people said if I've been training six, seven days a week and nonstop and I'm really taking that approach to it because I think the quality of session over the quantity of session is, is sort of more important. So I'm kind of relying on my base fitness. But I've been like, uh, with the swimming, I've been increasing distance one week, then doing faster intervals the other, sort of chopping and changing like that. So I've been doing like two swims a week on and off. Um and then with the cycling, I've been sort of just getting out on rides with whoever in different, you know, different groups and stuff. My girlfriend cycles a bit. So she's dragged me to a few places. Um went to Brighton on our first on our first long uh, long distance one. It's about 60 miles straight out the gun. And I felt it was okay really. So I've done a few more of those solo since. Um hoping to get out for another sort of 70 mile, 80 mile this weekend. Um, and it definitely it's definitely a fueling strategy for me that's the biggest worry I would say at this point um, so and the run I definitely haven't done enough running on this block but because I've had a bit of a hamstring thing just from the bike company set my saddle height the wrong height and then I was 20 miles into it before and then when I started to notice like the back of my hamstring tendon just tighten up so then it sort of bothered me the next couple of weeks sort of sporadically I could do intervals but I couldn't really do the long long stuff so yeah it's not been 100% prep but I couldn't really ask for anything you know better really in eight weeks you know I knew it was going to be like a brand new show I just didn't want to do a a regular triathlon or Olympic distance and then a half and then get into this I was like right let's just what's the idea of this go for as long as you can right okay I'm more a the mental side of it is more appealing, you know. Yeah. What's your What's your feeling with like, like we're in the off season now of high rocks? Do you feel like this is um, a good way to spend the off season, and like will that lead well into as you get into prep for a high rocks or or not? I mean, I've been careful not to sort of like overdo it, and that's why I didn't want to go completely mad spending every waking minute training because. When I go back to High Rocks, that won't feel great either. So um, the structure has been the hardest thing to stick to, just like knowing I've got to do something because in the off-season, generally speaking, you would kind of give yourself a bit of slack. Um, but yeah, with my age, mate, I can't really afford afford the time off. So I sort of put that pressure on myself to kind of knuckle down and kind of keep going. But um, it's yeah, a, no, it's it's just, a, It was a genuine question in terms of like, to me, it feels like it's better, like it's, it's it's a lower intensity type of training compared to going to try and do like let's say a Decker, which is like higher intensity. Like, yeah. In my mind, that's I think I'd prefer to spend the off season that way, the way you're doing it, 
uh, rather yeah, than like, crazy intensity. I'm learning two new skills. So swimming's been really good. Um, it was horrible and hard at first, and now I actually quite look forward to getting in. So that's been really enjoyable and stuff. Um, I'm still a bit nervous about it, I'm not going to lie, just because like it's open water with 200 other guys next to me. You know, I don't know the size of the waves yet, and I know the beginning is a bit hectic, but I'll just figure it out, you know? Um, yeah. And then the cycling, I'm I'm actually looking forward to closed roads, to be honest, and not having to stop at red lights and people trying to run me over. So I'm quite, I'm quite excited about that. Um, the, the second half of the run is going to get, I'm going to have to dig deep. It's going to be, you know, yeah, that's going to be mind games for sure. Just because I haven't done that amount of running since before I had my calf injury. And I've done a half a high rock season sort of getting building back up for that intensity. So yeah, it's not ideal prep. I'm not going to say otherwise, but like I said, I think, you know, I think I've mentioned to you before with endurance sports, the body breaks down anyway, after three hours, you know, after three hours, you're going to have to go into the mind and you're going to need carbs and stuff. And I've looked into the way a lot of top athletes train for Ironman. And it's, it's like, yes, there's definitely like an, an impressive amount of fitness, but it's an eating competition on the move. So the best Ironman in the world, you know, they can get like 120 grams of carbohydrates per hour into their stomach. That is, that's like, you know, two and a bit can of Cokes. But you obviously can't drink Coke, you know, for 11, 12 hours or eight, even eight hours. So you have to sort of, you know, shuffle it around and it's just finding these balances. And it's a balancing act for your stomach to deal with. So I, my stomach hasn't had that long to adjust to that type of fueling and it's all about dealing with the correct electrolyte sodium balance and hydration balance in your stomach so you can absorb the glucose and sucrose in the carbohydrates if you dehydrated you just tend to not absorb it and if you're over dehydrated um, if you're dehydrated you tend not to absorb it and if you're overly hydrated you can kind of just you know get the runs type of thing so it's very it's very delicate balance really and that's why you kind of need real food on the bike and my stomach doesn't love gels anyway i might be all right on the second half of the run but i don't want to start fueling with gels first that'll be the wrong format for me so i've had to experiment with all kinds of different types of food on the bike um so yeah that's the hardest part i would say yeah, um, yeah to go go on well, I was going to ask about your, like you mentioned your calf. Last time we spoke, I, th I think it was nine months ago since we, sp we, we, we spoke on here and it was uh, like you were struggling with the calf. Uh, like how, have, how has the, the rehab been from that? And are you like having to adjust your, your, your running volume still as a result of that? Um, so I haven't thought about it. all throughout high rocks. It was absolutely fine. Like from, since I came back in Barcelona in March, like I literally didn't think about it like it was all good for like 8, 10, 12 kilometers and stuff of intervals and you know pre-fatigue running and compromised running it, it was fine um, and then like I said it was absolutely fine until I had this hamstring kind of flare up I suppose and then I, didn't, I felt a couple of like twinges so I sort of, sort of I was you know cautious on the rest really but at least like, I want to get to the race and not blow up in training so I've just had to kind of manage it really, but like I don't think about it when I go on a run or anything like that. But it's certainly it's good not to push a sled. Like I had to push a sled the other day, just in the gym to move it, and I was like, oh, don't miss this at the moment. <laughs> you know, like it. You know, it's good to give your kind of Achilles and your your soleus a bit of a breather in the off season. Um, like I've been doing this a few years now, and I kind of I think this this kind of type of training that I'm doing for Ironman will help me like probably before christmas i think like november time i think i'll start i think i'll be due a good time in high rocks and you know i think all being well i'll be able to you know take a few few minutes off my previous so yeah um i have enjoyed the iron man but um i am kind of now like just more anxious to get it done because just you know i'd like to relax and enjoy my summer for a bit you know what's left of it yeah yeah, yeah. enjoy the rain <laughs> Enjoy um, the rain. That's it. Um, we'll say, is it like, like, like I said, it's nine months since we spoke. Have you changed your mind? If we go like to high rocks, have you changed your mind on 
on anything to do with higher ups in terms of the training for it? Any tactics, anything like that? Anything like springs to mind? That... Um, yeah, less less is more. Um, there's been a big like adaptation of my training. I've taken an extra rest day. Um, so I used to religiously when I first got into high rocks it was religiously like six days on one day off and that definitely helped but then as I sort of began to push and try to get to the next level I, you know you're only just one or two sessions away from kind of messing up your deload and kind of taper so probably just more rest and more kind of like um, just you know that allowed me to do the better intensity the harder intensity sessions better just stick to it for longer um slightly smaller training blocks as well went from like eight to six played around with that um and i would just say um that allows you to push a little bit harder on those really horrible like simulations or if you're doing intervals or whatever um and then just backed off kind of like i suppose for me personally like i love to just work out so just stopping at those sessions where they're just extra and they're not really serving you. You know, sometimes like it's nice, especially in my industry, right? You just leave the gym on a Friday and someone's like, oh, do you want to do a few sets on the bench? You know, and it's like, yeah, sure. You know, and you just have to learn to like, you don't need it. You have to say no if you're actually trying to progress. So it's that discipline really. Um, yeah. Tactically, um, like this season, I was like, I felt really good for the doubles at Olympia. Um, we just me and my partner didn't have our I guess we've been on different training programs and stuff and we weren't quite synced up but I felt really like really good but I, of course I'd just been back from you know from California for you know the, the previous week so I've been training with Hunter and like that taper I had leading up to Olympia I felt fantastic but I, I just wasn't able to maintain maintain it again up until um up until May to world champs so just learning kind of what works for me personally about my own performance and just learning that you as well as you can't peak more than a couple of times a year you know you're talking every kind of six months if you're truly doing it maybe if you're 20 23 you know you, you can you can you know obviously put more um you know put more peaks in your training and stuff and, and more races but you know i've got 20 years of playing decent level of football in my body and you know i'm still running around being trying to be a dad and um, you know, to my little one, and you know, full time self for a gig. So, you know, I don't, I don't sit still. You can speak to anyone that knows me. I, I, I rarely stop. So, endurance sports on top of endurance sports is kind of like, you know, it should be second nature to me. But then peaking for these things is actually like the skill in itself. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you just mentioned California and, and training with Hunter. And we talked we talked a bit last time about like some of the mindset traits that you see in him and everything like that. But mm -hmm. I'm interested to know, like from a pure training perspective, um like like you're you're a coach, been a coach for many years. Do you look at anything that he does? Well, have you picked up anything like in, in from what he does in your training, in his training, uh, and like incorporated it into yours? And also conversely, does he do anything you just think why on earth is he doing that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so one of the things I've really picked up on is, like, again, it sounds a little bit dull, but there is rest and then there's kind of true rest. Or, you know, some people think because they're not training, they're resting. You know, and that's really not the case. Um, like, I wouldn't say Hunter's a hermit per se, but when he's in camp, we are... You know, we don't go out. Like, it may look like fun and games on Instagram, and it is because we're all together, but when we're experiencing the same things, there's a really good atmosphere. We we watch, you know, a lot of movies, and we're always joking around. And But then we go to bed, it's lights out, and we get up and we train hard. And then when we're not, we're fueling, or we're stretching, or we're relaxing before another session. So you just get into this kind of, like, I would say, routine, pre-training and post-training, and try to implement that as much as I can in my own life while still keeping my other engagements. The less other social engagements and kind of pressures you have, then the more you can kind of bury yourself into camp mode. So 
yeah, I've picked up a few tips um, over the years of training with good athletes, and yeah, Hunter's no different. Um, I would say I've definitely done some daft things training wise with Hunter as well. Um, just like you know, one of the things I flew out there, I'd, you know, on a red eye flight, I'm jet lagged, been on a plane for fourteen hours. Then I sleep at his six hours. I have some food, and then I'm doing like simulations at altitude that I've just got no business being part of. Do you know what I mean? And I know I know that, but it's almost like okay, if I can do this, it's like a mental warfare. It's like a David Goggins type workout where you kind of bank it and go right. That's for later. If I got through that, then that's going to serve me down the line. Yeah. As long as my body don't breaks, and that's the thing with experience, you learn what your body can and can't handle. So, yeah, occasionally I look at some of his training sessions and I'm like, oof, you know, why is he doing that in that order? Okay, that makes sense. Maybe that doesn't, but maybe he feels like he can do that. So I think it's just more as well. Like there's no like one exercise that he's doing where I go, what's that about? It's not about, it's not about individual prescription of exercise or actual training session. You, more, you, you look at it over like the, the, the days and the weeks that you spend together. It's more like a food thing. I'm like, why is he eating that? How can he eat that and then go and train? You know, it's more like those those sorts of things. You know, like I guess everyone has personal preference with fueling. Um, but you know, like he, you know, he's a, he's a specimen. You know, he's he's got that good. You know, he's got that good energy and you know that intensity and that drive. So it's focus really that's mostly impressive about you know what Hunter does. Like he sets aside his goal and then his world has to fit around that mm -hmm. you know, and, and I guess there's so he is just dialed in you know um, so that's that's the biggest lessons from that not so much the individual training session um, sometimes I like to ask him like how far is this run and I like to know sometimes and he'll give me like a vague answer and I'm like no no I need to know for my own volume dude you know, like I'm on, we're on different worlds right now. Like you've been building up to this. I've been doing this before. So, you know, normally I speak to him a few weeks before I go out to try to get on a similar sort of path and intensity. And yeah, like I lift, lift more with Hunter. I lift longer with Hunter and I run further and I run faster when I train with Hunter. And that's why I do it. You know, just like any other camp you're a part of, you raise your own intensity so that's why like you know iron sharpens iron mm -hmm. so if you get your volume you know accumulation correct then it's all about kind of like holding back and then letting it go for a race day and that's obviously him being a three-time world champ you could say that he's an expert at. so you learn from that and then you implement it into your, into your own training um, um yeah. i want to ask you like separately i want to ask you about recovery and um i think you touched on it in a message with me but like you, you sort of just mentioned with hunter like it's proper relaxation outside of outside of a training session but are you using any other uh recovery strategies at the moment that you think are particularly important um so i sauna when i ice bath um so i sauna after like weight sessions i don't really sauna after cardio sessions because you don't want to sweat twice um, it's just more electrolytes you have to replace so like sauna can is definitely beneficial but if you've already sweated really intensely then you're already dehydrated right so then to go and do that again as part of a recovery might not have the benefit you think it has um yeah definitely the hot cold so you get that contrast um, contrast treatment is really, really good for you so sometimes pre sometimes post depending on what my schedule is um normally i sleep better if i jump in like cold shower um or sometimes after training at gym box i'll just uh, have a cold shower before i before i come home just kind of makes me relax a little bit easier um when we're camp with hunter yeah we sort of you know hot cold often it's just a nice way to end the training and that you know definitely in that atmosphere there's no light stimulus like there is in london there's no sound sim stimulus like trains and buses and cars and ambulances it's just you're in nature so you just switch off so much more quickly and then your body's in a state of readiness quicker the next day because you've rested correctly so it's really about embracing kind of like 
the low technology side of things mm -hmm. because that's when your body's going to get into its circadian rhythm a lot faster. The more technology you have around you, I don't care if it's the Wi-Fi router, iPad, iWatch, iPhone, 70-inch plasma TV, you've got everything. And the, all these devices are constantly searching for each other, right? So you've got those vibrations. That are, it's like background noise. And you maybe you can't see them. And sometimes you wouldn't know if you feel them. But all of a sudden, when you're in the in the woods and the mountains, and there's nothing, <laughs> you, you feel a lot better. Yeah. And that's you know that's why getting out in nature is so important. Not just for like a performance side, but just for like health, longevity. You know, that's why men like playing golf because there's nothing else to do out there, right? You just walk around it outside, swinging a stick. So, I think from the performance side of things, simplify your sleep routine, simplify your pre-workout routine, whether it's a certain type of food, and then simplify your post-workout routine. And that, all of a sudden, that might find, for some, that's going to be like rearranging their life. For others, that's going to be really subtle. It depends what level you're competing at and what level you need to get to. So, yeah, that's what my hybrid project's about. It's about helping people implement changes for their, for them personally, helping them how to like get the best out of their training hours they have available and it's you know i can train maybe eight nine hours a week some people are going to have three some people are going to have 16 but how that's all balanced and what how they can get the best out of that for them you've got to have certain pro protocols in place so you know just you know if you're going to spend all that time training you want to get the best out of your recovery and it might be really simple for some um a lot of it's breath work as well so um a lot of recovery breaths at certain times. Um, and then obviously right the right food is everything. So let's say when I'm on camp with Hunter, all these things, nine times out of ten are locked into place. Um, certain foods in America don't really deal with me, <laughs> deal with me uh, that well. Um, everything's cooked in some sort of crazy oil out there. So I have to be careful with what I eat. Just there's so much fast food, you have to be really careful. But um yeah, in, in the UK, I don't have any problems. Right. Um, you're a you, you have master trainer duties in the in the UK, and that, uh, I think that's primarily like you you're coaching the coaches in affiliate gyms, right? Is that um, well, what what's the uh, have you seen that grow quite a lot in in the past year or so? And what's like yeah. the main things that you're like? taking them through and maybe like other gym owners getting wrong that are listening to this or anything like that anything you can share from that perspective yeah so one of the roles of being being one of the master trainers is basically they have affiliate coaching days so new gyms will send their coaches to become high rocks trainers so there's some very simple stuff about the day and there's some little more interesting stuff so obviously we go through standards and movements and stuff um, and then we talk about how they're setting up classes for their gyms and what to do if you haven't got this equipment or this equipment, how workouts need to flow and not bottleneck. And then we talk about energy systems and like some, we touch on periodization so that people can actually train maybe their own clients one-to-one -one or their group X over some sort of program. So then we touch on some, a few do's and don'ts with loading format and why it makes sense to do one type of workout on this particular day over another. And then how to like progressively overload that and also then how to deload that so that people can get some sort of taper. And then just, you know, training principles, you know, strength and conditioning principles, we touch on that just so that people aren't just doing full simulations, obviously, like, you know, twice a week, like I've been messaged about and overdoing it. And that's the, like I said, I touched, go right back to the beginning. I've learned to adjust my own volume so that I can feel fresher and you know that way you can train uh, you know you, you'll have more impressive results over six months to a year than you will maybe over like you know three or four months so it's a little bit sort of slower methodical approach but I think it's it's going to keep you long term in the sport and it's going to keep you healthy you know so that's the most important thing right so we go through the trainers with that and then there's a little bit of like how you know, it's not this is not my role, but the other day is about marketing, like how 
things can market their gym, you know, to embrace new memberships and to get more people, you know, people involved in the sport itself. So there's a fitness agency, it's called CMA. They come in and do a presentation. Uh, and then there's a little PFT workout so people can actually feel what it's like to, um, you know, to do some sort of simulation that involves a lot of high rocks movements. So that's pretty much the day. But it's good. There's been a lot of feedback. And depending on kind of what questions I get asked or what kind of, you know, each one is probably slightly different because I get asked slightly different questions about training. So, um, but normally I'll test coaches kind of knowledge about their own periodization or their formatting or how they're going to train. If this person can't do this and what person's got an injury or how you're going to do it for someone that's got, you know, calf, calf injury, you know, we're going to do that. If you, if you open up a sled workout, what are your other options? And just get people thinking to have a, like, uh, you know, more exercises on the go so that, you know, high rocks is for everybody, you know, so it doesn't have to just suit the high end athlete. You know, because let's face it, it's it's got to be, you know, mass involvement, which means you've got to have a lot of exercise off the top of your head ready to go so that people that aren't at the level yet they need to be can still partake and still do group exercise. I mean, that's part of one of the missions of High Rocks, right? Yeah. So. Okay. All right, great. Um, the question I asked a, a lot of people in here, and we never talked about it last time, was uh, mindset and where your mind goes in the depths of a race, like when things are getting tough, um, which you might need in a few weeks in the in Ironman. So, what, yeah. what 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 do you think about? Um, I mean, I've had like good mindset races, and I've had terrible ones. Um, so normally I think about my when it's good. I think about my breathing and pacing and staying relaxed and kind of just like smiling and just then concentrating on the laps and just counting them off. And then I think about like executing each station just like in training. So that's when it's going good. It becomes a bit more of a like, a, this is what I do in training. This is what I'm going to do now. And it's just like, I might repeat a little phrase to myself, just something that I can keep an eye on. Um, that's when it's going well. Um, things that distract me when it's not going well are kind of like if I'm thirsty or my mouth is dry or like, you know, or the layout's a bit funky, or it's like two and a half, three laps, or they've changed the order. They've not changed the order, but the warbles are not in the middle like they normally are. Maybe they're somewhere else, and now I've got to run an extra half lap, like in Glasgow. Um, and then if I know that I'm not at my best, and then I, I think about, oh, what's everyone else going to think about? You know, they're going to say, oh, he's a master trainer, he hasn't put in a good time. I think about stuff like that because, you know, people will probably look at my time and go, oh, I'll be him, he's the trainer, great. So, you know, that's, that's normal, you know, I, but I kind of, you know, have the mental strength to know that that's not my best and I can sum it all up better than anybody else. I don't have to explain to everybody else what's going on constantly, but I know when, when my best is and what my, you know, what is below that. So I have to kind of, I guess, mentally juggle all those things. So mm -hmm. I probably stress too much about that in the middle of a race and not just like get my head down and finish it. And I've definitely been guilty of like, once I can't, like you figure out like if you can beat your personal best, probably by, you know, coming off like the farmers, right. And then going into lunges, you kind of go, oh, I need to do that and that. And then you go, oh shit. Now I've got to run a 330, <laughs> you know, on the last lap. <laughs> and, you, and, you, and your body goes, Oof. so it's, it's about not getting too involved in that. But I've definitely gone the other way and gone, well, I can't beat it, so I'll just back right off. You know, I don't want to feel that pain for no reason. So future lessons are about staying focused on the task at hand, you know, and not playing that mental arithmetic game because maybe you're on pace, maybe you're off. So I think my, you know, my first couple of races were my fastest, and that's just because I was totally relaxed and totally just, like, calm about it. So, yeah, there's lessons in there, but um, there's no, like, I'm not singing a song. I'm not, you know, there's no, like, uh, like it's not a happy, happy place for me to be in, but it's like, there's an enjoyment in that challenge. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, 
I guess that's rewarded. Like it's like delayed gratification. Like I don't think it's the nicest feeling in the world, but it can be when you're matching and you're meeting your own expectation of your intensity. That's when it like flows, and that's when you can be like, right, yes, let's get into this. What's not nice is when you know, I don't know, maybe someone cuts you up and he throws you off your pace a little bit. Maybe um, your station doesn't go quite well how you want it to, and then you start getting these like little knocks or you know, you run the corner a little bit wide or you slow down too much, whatever it is, you have to kind of just let all that wash over you. Yeah. So those are, the, those are the biggest challenges really, but it's nothing too exciting. I know Hunter like recites like the names of people that are the best in the world per station and then calls them out. <laughs> I've actually got some videos of him doing it. It's quite amusing, but um, yeah, he's uh he gets super intense and, um, yeah, maybe I maybe I'll try that. Maybe I won't. I don't know. That's that's him. You know, it's not not necessarily me. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. Um, you you mentioned hybrid project uh, a few minutes back. Yes. Tell us tell us what you're doing there. So we're at Mike's gym in Marbella on the fourth of October to the eighth of October, and yeah, we're basically using it as like a preseason camp. Those dates fit in perfectly if you're doing kind of Dublin or if you're doing uh, London at the Excel. And you can really use that to kind of like kind of ramp up last part of your training block. And then you can adjust to your taper so that you can peak for the race. So yeah, I'll be training a couple of times each day. There'll be flow sessions. There'll be weight sessions. There'll be mobility, a lot about a lot of focus on recovery and some workshops about how to structure this periodization into the rest of your high rock season. So it's kind of a sum of all parts of everything I've learned about high rocks from training with, you know, Kyle and Cole and Hunter and these guys are you know, absolute animals and then my own experience. So we're going to train in the sun, obviously it's going to be a lot nicer than here um, and training outside, which is obviously like a, you know, that variable. You can't really, you can't underestimate how important that is for your, for your mental well-being like training outside certainly indoors every day it's you know it's a, it's a different game so that camp will be kind of like it's been probably 20 years in the making like how I've wanted to run my own camp and how uh, what I've wanted to touch on like the fun the band so and building relationships with people I always love but just getting that kind of intensity balance right between like yeah we're pushing hard and this is it's right on the edge but you're not going over it I think that's something that I really have like dialed in now and yeah I'm excited to kind of you know share that with other people and um, yeah there's a few spaces left so I think we've already got 12, 13 people booked on we wanted to keep it relatively small so we can really get into the, the nitty gritty of it per person you know because everyone's going to come from a slightly different background right and a slightly different perspective of their own season so if it's too busy, then that person may may not get may not get the attention they need. But with a smaller number like that, then we can just focus on them and their story a little bit. So that is going on. Like I said, fourth October to the eighth. Um, there's also if people can't make that because of like childcare stuff, because over weekend or jobs or whatever, they can come Friday to Sunday as well. And like flights to Malaga are pretty cheap at the moment, so it's just a good 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 little escape before the season starts. So yeah, where should people go if they want to find out more about that and sign up and yeah. so on? Yeah, so there's a link on my main tag on the G Hyrox Master Trainer, and there's also you know, at the Hybrid Project as well on Instagram, and there's links to a website. So the Hybrid Project uh, UK dot com. Okay, all right, sweet. Yeah, and um, one last question, which I've been asking everyone on the on on this pod is. Uh, if you could put a, a message out on a billboard that, that would go out to the world that could say absolutely anything, what would it be? <laughs> a billboard that could go out to the world. Oh, this is terrible, these questions. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I should have warned you. <laughs> yeah. I need like two. Um, um, but da, 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 da. God. You really put me on the spot. I wanted to say something like profound and historic, <laughs> and then I haven't got it. Um, I would say, um, I 
would say but no idea what I would say. Something like suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Um no, I would say make sure you uh, you know, just like do what you love and you know, don't don't take your foot off the gas. You know, so something along that line, you know, I don't think it, you know, with what I've been through personally with friends and stuff, life is pretty delicate and you know, it's finally it, we do walk this tightrope and um you just have to grab every moment you can that's good and enjoy it so something along those lines i'm not a marketer i don't think i could put it on a billboard but there's there's already quotes like that that exist um that's good i like it yeah and then the other one i would say warbles suck <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah i don't know that's why i need two but yeah something kind of motivating but kind of personal um so i'd go with that but people would drive by and ignore it right They'd be like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Whatever. <laughs> well, that's <cool>, corny. <laughs> They'd keep scrolling. They just drive faster. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they see it enough, if they see it enough, they might take notice. <laughs> yeah. You have to really like, that's what, one of the things I've learned is that attentions of different generations are very different, right? Like our generation, we, we remember growing up with our phone and we remember kind of having to call a girl's house and ask them out on a date and then kind of having to do this whole dance with the family to get to the, you know, get to speak to the girl. And now you speak, you see a 20 year old, they're just on apps, they swipe. They're kind of non-committal with everything, you know, from like the type of coffee they're on, the diet, the group, the gym membership. And it's very hard to kind of like, you know, see that because, you know, you understand that like your dad may have said something to you as older about your generation. But then you see it and experience it for yourself and you go, oh my God, like they're right. And they, you know, people just don't, don't appreciate what they have and the opportunities. And it, we're in such an information age, but we're not executing it. You know, we're kind of in this like analysis paralysis of everything, all the data we have, we don't know how to use it. So then we freak out and we don't do anything well. So I would say it's, you know, if you can focus and operate on one thing at one time, and actually think about what you want to do and not someone else's expectation, then you're probably going to be, you're going to realize that the simple things in life are actually a lot better. And so I come full circle. My billboard would say, turn your, turn your fucking phone off. <laughs> 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 and That's a good one. Bang, and then bang, bang some iron, something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but I mean, it's, yeah, it's a connection thing. I love meeting new people when I love talking about all things fitness. So if I can do those things, then I'll be very happy. Um, but obviously like health is the number one goal, right? I don't think any other problems uh, in comparison, they're just, you know, they, uh, they dwindle, right? The health is still, uh, still the number one. So, yeah. All right, awesome. All right, well, thank you for this. Um, really appreciate it. What's, what's, have you got any high rocks booked yet? Or are you? Uh... I'm still Wait. kind of. I'm an an I'm going to get through this Iron Man malarkey with um, with Hunter and Kyle and Jake. Um, so we're going to do that. But then we've got a little something at Forders at the end of the month, and then Hunter's going to be sleeping on my futon for a couple of weeks. Um, so we'll be kind of training and socialising and being about. And then I'm going to start my training block beginning of September. So then I'll know how I feel and then kind of look at a race to kind of dial in. Um, but I haven't thought about it just yet. I might get all excited and just sign up for, London, for Dublin or I might just wait and kind of see what's in November and try to look for somewhere to escape this weather. <laughs> so <laughs> it looks like November out there already. It does, it's it does. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, brilliant. Thank, thank, thank you for this. Good luck for the, uh, good luck for the Iron Man. Yeah. Really and appreciate I'll, you. Uh, I'll yeah. catch you again soon. Yeah, definitely, mate. Brilliant. Right. The podcast is flying. I'm hearing great things about it. The front and center still. So you're doing a good job, mate. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Things are going well. So yeah, can't complain. Can't complain. Yeah. No, good for you, man. Good for you. That's All awesome. Right. All right, All right. bye. Too late. Speak to you shortly. Cheers, mate.